Welcome to the Team Snap Podcast. I'm Emily Cohen. Many youth athletes dream of being able to play their beloved sport, or in extremely rare cases, multiple sports, in college. Some of these athletes actually achieve that goal. But do they, or you, their parents, really know what that dream entails? My guest today, Natalie Doyle, just graduated pre-med from Harvard University and was a four-year starter on the women's volleyball team, captaining the team in her senior year. She also received the Harvard Radcliffe Foundation for Women's Athletics Prize at the end of the year, which is awarded annually to the senior woman who best exemplifies the qualities of excellent scholarship, character, leadership, and athletic ability. Growing up in San Francisco, Natalie played every sport in elementary and middle school until finally specializing in volleyball in high school. She played all four years at St. Ignatius College Prep, as well as on club teams throughout the Bay Area. And if that weren't enough, Natalie also served as student body president her senior year at SI. So Natalie, tell me how you found the balance between academics, athletics, and student life in college. You, you had a lot to, to juggle there. It's definitely a lot to juggle. You get to college and you're just so excited to just kind of to be away from home and to be in that completely new environment where just absolutely everything changes, your friends, where you live. And, you know, above and on top of all of that, you have a pretty much a full level job of being a varsity athlete. I think that, I mean, mean, it's definitely a process. I very much relied on teammates to help me pick classes. I kind of had to make sure that my roommates understood my sleep schedule. And kind of from, from there, I just kind of tried to make sure that I just kind of constantly evaluated to make sure I was able to perform as well as I wanted, both in the classroom and on the court. So what kind of sacrifices did you have to make? I never really felt like I sacrificed in terms of what classes I could take, although there are a couple tough classes I might have taken, like, you know, maybe more computer science if I hadn't been an athlete, since most of those were offered during, um, during the fall, which is when volleyball season was. But most of the sacrifices I found were, uh, were social, at least at the beginning, not being able to, um, to go to, you know, certain events or, or even kind of office hours that, which is, you know, definitely academic, the more that I think about it, it's, you kind of have to really make do with much more limited time. And while you can take the classes, you don't usually have time, have um, have access to all the study resources where, um, for example, if some of the office hours are, you know, three to five, that's practice time. That just means you have to be a little bit more proactive in terms of seeking out help from your teaching assistants. But I mean, I was able to work that out, um, cause I've been pretty proactive, but it's, it's definitely something that you don't really see coming kind of not being able to have all of those resources that all the other students have. Interesting. So when you were looking at colleges, obviously Harvard is not, you know, one of the easier ones. <laughs> um, was that a consideration? Did you kind of balance, gee, that's going to be, a, you know, it's going to be tough already to be an athlete and I'm taking on this huge academic course. Maybe it would have been easier if I'd gone somewhere else. D- did that even come into play in your decision? No, I always knew that I wanted to go to a a top academic institution and play volleyball. And this was really just the perfect marriage of both. And while it it was definitely challenging, I feel like I, I feel like that was almost part of, that was one of the most valuable lessons I learned, really learning to be proactive in, in seeking out that academic help and also just kind of learning how to find that balance. I mean, you can't do everything and it's a lesson you have to learn eventually. And I was able to, I think, walk that line the best that I possibly could. I was, you know, still able to do a lot of, uh, do a lot of traveling to Africa, three trips during my, uh, during my college years, I was able to take almost all the pre-med classes until I realized I didn't want to do it, which is a, you know, a full, a full, a whole other story and, and, uh, have a couple other extracurriculars as well. So I think that that was because I was able to, to be very organized. I know, you know, most other athletes, how, you know, maybe we'll do, or at least at Harvard, we'll do, you know, maybe, maybe another extracurricular, but volley, but volleyball or their sport is pretty much, um, pretty much, you know, their extracurricular life, which is completely understandable because it is a lot. But I, um, I found that, you know, really being 
organized was what let me do that. So what were your priorities as a Harvard volleyball player? I mean, so much of college athletics is saying no to things that are important, but just don't make the your top lift, list of priorities because you're needed in so many places and there are only 24 hours in a, in a day. I mean, athletes get asked to do volunteer work. They get asked to do a speaking gig. How did you prioritize all those things? Right. So it, I think it came down to the, the, that the top two had to be my classes and my sport. And I definitely made a lot of sacrifices to be able to make sure that I did all my work and was able to go into midterms and exams really prepared, having studied as much as I would have wanted to if I'd had unlimited time. But that, you know, really meant that I had to miss, like I said earlier, a lot of a lot of social events and a lot of the extracurricular, you know, speakers I would have liked to go to, things like that. But in terms of the other thing that was important to balance sports, that really comes down to sleep. And that is probably what will cut into your academic time the most. You know, I found that so many other students would go to bed just so late. You know, sometimes I'd be getting up for practice when a roommate would be going to sleep, which is <laughs> which is never fun. But it's um, you definitely have to have to know what your body needs. And especially for me, I need eight, nine hours of sleep in order to to perform on the court. And that's kind of why I had to be so organized so that I could also, you know, do as well as I wanted to and get all that I could out of the Harvard academic experience. So take me through a typical day. What time did you get up? Then you you had practice. It sounded like it was in the morning. Take me through that. Sure. So sometimes we had uh, lifts in the morning. So depending on, you know, which, which year it was, sometimes the, our, uh, our weightlifting would be in the mornings and sometimes it would be right before practice. But I guess on a typical day, it would be getting up, um, uh, maybe at about nine 30, just kind of grabbing a bagel and heading off to a 10 AM class, having a pretty full class day, kind of breaking for a quick lunch sometime, sometime in there running off to practice and lift, kind of kind of get home from dinner, which was, you know, usually a team dinner. Um, optional, but, you know, it was always fun and everybody liked to go. And then, you know, work until pretty much do as much work as I could um, since the rest of my day had pretty much been occupied by class or meetings with teaching, teaching assistants or, you know, of course, practice. And then try to get, try to get in bed by one and kind of uh, start it over again and really try to do as much school and uh, school and volleyball while, you know, staying sane and getting as much time as, you know, I could with my friends. Staying sane. (laughs) Yeah, it's, it's a, that's an important part. If you just, if you only do school and your sport, you'll go nuts. I mean, that's why, I mean, I got really lucky. I had a very social team. I loved practice. I just got to hang out with my best friends for, you know, for three hours. And so that was a ton of fun. But, you know, of course, you know, I had friends in my classes. I would have friends I'd meet for lunch. But if, you know, if, you know, you see some people who are really struggling with that balance and, you know, they need to reach out and they need to connect with other people because they're not the only ones going through it, but, you know, it can seem pretty hard. So you brought up a really interesting point earlier when you were talking about sleep and making sure your roommates knew your sleep schedule, because I think a lot of colleges don't, at least as freshmen or maybe sophomore, you know, two volleyball players together who would have the same schedule. You're, you're a volleyball player who's put with somebody who's not, maybe not even an athlete. So how do you, what kinds of things does a, would, would a kid just going to college have to think about in terms of their roommate situation? Yeah, it's, um, that's an important conversation to have. For me, knowing that I needed a lot of sleep, I really kind of never messed around with getting less sleep than I needed, which I saw a lot of my other teammates doing, just kind of showing up to practice kind of sluggish and then having to figure out their sleep pattern that way because they realized they couldn't perform. I really, I mean, I just knew I've always needed a lot of sleep. And so I had told my roommates, you know, I'm, I'm going to go to bed. Okay. Maybe freshman year, I took it a little bit too seriously. I was like, okay, I'm going to go to bed at like 1130, which was very early, but, and so, you know, I didn't want, them to, I had a very social room. I lived with five roommates as a freshman. And so there was always something going on in the common room. There were always people over. And so I kind of learned to pick my battles there. And I realized that while I'd asked them to be quiet, I also needed to get some earplugs, get a fan, and just kind of curl up in my room and block the sound that way. 
I think I'm going to make sure to tell my son about all this <laughs> as he goes to college this fall. Uh, the you know the college sent just a you know a compatibility questionnaire. Oh yeah, and I'm really not sure he answered it uh, honestly. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the roommate thing is very important. And even when I got to choose my roommates, uh, for example, this year, I also had five roommates. We all had singles, though, this time, which was really nice. And four of us were athletes. And so the discussion about, you know, who got which room, you know, who got the rooms farthest away from the common room, you know, that was a really big discussion. And one thing that people don't don't usually uh, think about is even if you're placed with another athlete, if they're a different season, a lot of times that won't be enough. Because, for example, uh, you know, I live with swimmers and my season was over in the fall. Their season wasn't over until, you know, February or March. And they were up for, you know, double days. They were up at, you know, 530 every morning. And then as soon as my season was over, I could sleep in and, you know, I could stay up late and my sleep schedule was so off. And so it was trying to figure out that balance that, you know, because it's different for every single sport. You know, some sports will have early mornings. Some sports won't. Some sports are lighter in their off season. Some sports have their off season as the toughest time of their of their year. And so these are discussions. These are discussions, to you know, that are really important and that people honestly don't usually think about enough because living situation is huge. You want to make sure you can come home and, you know, have it feel like home. So that's clearly one thing that really changed from high school to college in terms of being your the athletics. Oh, yeah. What what other things changed? Were there differences in terms of coaching styles that you had to get used to? Expectations? Absolutely. Coaching styles, ah, coaching was pretty much completely opposite. My my coach has been at Harvard for about 20 years and um yeah, the coaching styles are absolutely different. You know, it's different having those mandatory lifts that you do with your team. I never had that before. And, you know, really having, I mean, honestly, one thing that I was just so absolutely ecstatic about was that I could walk to practice because I'd been playing club (laughs) volleyball where I'd, you know, drive an hour and a half to practice. I was like, this is the best thing ever. (laughs) And so, you know, that was great. Um, But, you know, that's a whole other topic with my club choices. Did you go in with a certain set of expectations of playing a certain position that ended up changing once you got there? Sure. So I was recruited to be a setter. I'm 5'7", although the roster will tell you that I'm 5'8". You know, come on, that's with shoes. So <laughs> so I was recruited to be a setter. I'd been a setter my whole life um, ever since I started playing club volleyball when I was 10 years old. And I mean, of course, you know, being a setter, you also play defense, but that's not your main role. Main role is to set and kind of really be that, you know, quote unquote quarterback. But um, I, you know, really wasn't tall enough. And, you know, my coach said she would consider running um, a running a lineup where I would set out of the back row, but not out of the front row because she didn't think I was tall enough to play front row, even though I was. But, you know, that's OK. Um, And so really ended up going with a setter that could set all the way around, which basically means she could play front row too. So someone who was taller, who could jump higher, who could also block. So I ended up transitioning to be a defensive specialist in a libero, which, no, definitely was tough because I'd been used to um, been used to playing, you know, a kind of a, a. completely different game, a different mental game. Uh, serve receive was really challenging for me because it was something that I'd never done before. And so it was absolutely trying to learn how to, you know, use a completely different, you know, mental approach to the game. I think that was almost harder because many of the skills were similar. It was really learning to approach the game differently because my role was completely different. Um, I actually ended up really loving that. I think part of that might have been because I'd played volleyball for so long. I found it really refreshing and invigorating to have that change. And I think that maybe that attitude was what a what was was what allowed me to, I guess, do well in that change. So you were clearly out, an outstanding volleyball player in high school and you were rec- recruited by Harvard. When you got there, did you feel a sense of oh boy, I'm out of my league. Did you feel like you fit in? Oh yeah, I definitely felt like I fit in. It was, it was great to play with, uh, play with other players who, you know, really chose to play for a school where they, they, you know, weren't on scholarship, but instead chose financial aid and to be there. And I think that that was, you know, a very 
unique part of playing for a non-scholarship school is that every year, everyone who comes out for the team, they really want to be there. They are not paid to be there. And, you know, we had little turnover. Everyone was a high caliber player, had been recruited, you know, mostly out of California, Florida, a little bit of Colorado. And I, I just absolutely loved it. I, you know, my teammates were, you know, both talented and, you know, incredibly interesting and fun people. And I just loved getting to know them and playing with them for four years. So you just brought up the scholarship issue. So obviously, Harvard is technically a D1 school, but as an Ivy League does not give scholarships. How do you think it was similar or different than other D1 schools where they do give scholarships and um, being an athlete is is more of a job that comes before school? Right. And honestly, it's still a job at at a, you know, a non-scholarship school. I mean, it's a D1 school, and I feel like, especially with the Ivies, a lot of people are starting to turn down scholarships to go to, go to these schools. I think that as the Ivy, as Ivy sports get better and as financial aid continues to get better, this is more and more of an option for people, and Ivy sports have continued to get better year after year. And I, I mean, it's still a job. It's still something that, you know, that you have to do um, because you, you know, you decided that, you know, this was what you wanted to do during college. But, you know, at the same time, under extreme circumstances, if someone, for example, realizes they have a major that they really want to do, they can just kind of, they can quit. And I mean, it doesn't have to happen often, but they can quit and, you know, keep on going to school versus if someone's, you know, if someone's school was contingent upon their, their scholarship, that would have been a very different story. In some sense, it sounds like there's a greater degree of freedom for an athlete at an Ivy or say a division three school that also doesn't give scholarships than for a D one. Right. Athlete. And I, I always got to pick my own classes. I was never told what to take. I was never told here's an athlete's list. It was always, you know, you do what you need to do. We'll respect, you know, the fact that you want to be, be a good student and a good athlete. There's freedom to do some other extracurriculars. Um, there's, you know, and then, you know, kind of by team, You know, this was at least for my team, I was free to be in a sorority. Some other teams weren't. But I mean, there absolutely is is more freedom. And I found that um, especially in the Ivy League with their regulations on offseason practices and summer workouts, I was able to travel. I was able to uh, to do to do, you know, real jobs, which was really, really wonderful, especially in preparing me for the real world. And so I think that that freedom translates to letting people become you know, more than just athletes, but really become scholar athletes, which I don't think is always an honest term at a lot of scholarship schools and also kind of let them become, you know, better prepared for the real world because it's coming. So how did you manage to do all that travel? I know that um, being an athlete often means that you have to forego studying abroad if you're how did you balance that? How did you fit that in? Sure. I never studied abroad during the semester because that's when we had our either season or team workouts. And so instead, I, I traveled during our January break and the summer. So during, we, uh, Harvard has a six-week Christmas break. We call it J-term or January term. And I was able to go to Uganda once and, and then Kenya once during those J-terms. And that was honestly a perfect time because we come back and we kind of ease into our spring workouts. And of course, you know, I did what I could to stay in shape. There was, you know, a lot of insanity videos and other things that I could do. Pretty much I kind of did everything, everything that I could, but obviously was limited, you know, couldn't exactly find a weight room there. Sean T to the rescue. Oh, absolutely. He was great. Kicked my butt. (laughs) Those are not easy. No, they're not. (laughs) No, they're absolutely not. But I think um, I think that worked out really well for me, especially knowing my sport. I did that sophomore and junior year because I kind of knew that um, as long as I worked out, I would be able to come into the spring season and be okay. But that you know that's something that is school school specific, team specific, um, and I was really able to find out that that worked for me. And on my team, a lot of a lot of the student athletes do study abroad during the summer. And I was able to do that and, again, kind of do the same type of workout thing. And then my um, my program ended in, uh, I think, mid-July. And I was able to have about, you know, a month and a half to, you know, really amp up those workouts to make sure that what I'd been doing had been 
uh, had been enough to get me in shape for the preseason camp. So when you made your decision about where to go to college, did you ever ask yourself, would I still want to be at that school if I, if I suffered an injury, if I couldn't play? I think that that is the most important question that you can ask because that happens to so many students. So many things can happen. You can not like your coach. You can get kicked off your team. You cannot make your team. You can get a season-ending injury. I mean, anything can happen. And I Career-ending in- injury, a even. Career-ending injury, absolutely. I mean, I think that's the biggest mistake people make is not asking that question, and then their sport doesn't work out, and they're stuck at a school, and then they transfer, um, which, you know, is a good it's a good decision for people who are in those positions. But it's, you know, that's really tough. So a lot of people go through that. It's hugely important. I really can't stress that enough. You've got to be going to a school that you know you'll like. So if you could go back and do something different in the recruiting process or decision process, is there anything you might do differently? Not really. No. What about your parents? Were they involved? I mean, they were obviously really involved when you were a youth athlete because they were driving you places and, um, you know, they came to all your games, but obvious or, or maybe not obviously, but I'm sure they came to a lot of your games, especially in high school. Did, did they help you with videos and the recruiting process or was it all you? Yeah, they were very supportive of the recruiting process. I was not, I mean, I, you know, received, you know, letters, but I wasn't, you know, exactly <laughs> good enough or tall enough to play at the schools where I could just kind of sit back and let the recruiting happen for me. I had to be very proactive about it. And it was a lot of emails and and film and visits. And, you know, I was, I, I needed my parents' support for that. And they were very much on board. Did you coordinate those videos and the film yourself? Or did you go find somebody to, to video you? Or did they help you put that all together? Yeah, they, they would set up the camera before matches and then kind of, uh, when I was putting together the film, I would, you know, watch all the games, figure out which were the ones I wanted to send, and then, you know, kind of send send the game footage that way. I think that having a parent do the film is just as good as having a as having some as having a pro do it, and a lot cheaper, which I think that they appreciated. <laughs> I mean, we we all know there aren't as many professional athletic opportunities for women, and you know, volleyball is is one of those sports that there really isn't a professional opportunity for women. Was that something you thought about? Was that ever a goal? Um, I'm going to correct that and say that there are professional opportunities for volleyball in the U.S. If you want to do that, you go abroad. And I've had some teammates do that and go abroad and play in Europe, um, in Europe after graduation. But um, I, no, I, I really never was worried about that. I always knew that volleyball, I wanted to play as long as I could, and then uh, real life would have to happen, and I would, you know, find a rec league or something fun after after volleyball or after college and, you know, try to keep playing however I could. But I really knew that this was my, my last four years and that I wanted to get everything out of it. So speaking of real life, a lot of athletes have identity issues when they stop college athletics. They're no longer, you know, Joe Green football player for X university or whatever. Why do you think that is? And how, how do you think athletes can avoid that? I mean, it sounds like you had a goal that was beyond that already, but some, some kids really don't, they don't know what to do once they're, they're done. Yeah, I think that, I mean, being an athlete is so much a part of your identity. It's your friend group. It's what you do every day. It's, you know, what you're known as on campus. It's a lot of it is pretty much who you are. But I think it's really important to make it a big, important part, but a part of who you are. And I think the reason why I didn't have as much of an identity crisis was because I knew what I wanted to do after. I know a lot of, um, I mean, if you want to go pro, great, then, you know, you keep that identity and that will work for you. But for most athletes, you can't go pro after and you have to figure out what you want to do. And I think that that's a really important thing to have been thinking about all four years. You have to um, be smart about whether or not you can get any internships, about what classes you take, about what academic opportunities or other career opportunities you take, because it's important to have kind of, you know, one foot in, um, and what's coming next, you have to at least be thinking about it so that you can, you know, be prepared and don't sit back and realize I can't do anything because I've seen a lot of that. You see people finish their sports and be like, well, well, what do I, what do I do now? I don't know what I want to do. And I don't have any job experience. And that I think is where the big identity crisis comes in. 
I want to talk a little bit more about the class selection because you touched on it briefly, but I think there's more there. How did, did your team kind of help you with class selection in terms of, hey, you know what, that's a great class, but you know, that's going to be too hard during season. Did you look at, you know, did, did you look at classes and create schedules that worked, you know, like the harder schedule when you weren't in season? Exactly. So I, it was very much figuring out, um, figuring out that balance. And in season, it was, you can take one or two tough, probably two tough classes, the other one. So I had Harvard, you just take four classes. It's not based on units. You take four courses. It was, you can take two tough classes and then the other two have to be kind of very light. Underwater BB stacking. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Underwater basket weaving, some, something like that. Right. But so, um, and so since I was a pre-med student, I had to, I had to, you know, really think about that. And I know my freshman year I took, you know, I took a math, I took a bio, and then I took a couple of writing classes, which, you know, for me were lighter, much lighter than the pre-med classes, which were just a ton of science and a lot of homework. And it was, you know, and then trying to take a little bit of a heavier load in the spring semester. When, you know, obviously I still had a lot of practices, but I wasn't constantly on the road. So that was something important to think about. And then, and then, like I said earlier, you know, I always, I wish that I could have taken, you know, the intro computer science class, but that was just known as an absolute monster, which, and a lot of it happens, you know, kind of at night, like it's kind of a cult thing. A lot of the, a lot of the office hours are like 10 o'clock and I'm like, I'm in bed, I'm an athlete. And so I couldn't exactly ever take that class, which is something that I wish that I uh, could have done, but I just, just kind of didn't really work out for me. But usually almost every class, I mean, classes were available to me. It was just, that was a choice that I made that it wasn't worth compromising, you know, my athletics for one class. But, um, but it's definitely important. You have to make sure that the classes are not during practice. You have to make sure that they will give you enough time to, you know, sleep. But at the same time, you know, you do as much as you can to, you know, get your academic course load done. So you have two siblings, both at Stanford, both athletes. Do they look to you for this kind of advice? Did they come to you and say, you've been at a really rigorous, you know, academic institution and you've been an athlete there? You know, how do I, how do I do this? To an extent, they definitely did. And we, I mean, we talked about, about classes and balance, but you know, they also had great support systems there and with their teams. And so they were able to kind of figure them out for themselves. And then kind of on the whole computer science note, you know, Stanford has much more computer science and they offer, you know, they offer that intro class all three quarters. And, you know, so that was something that wasn't an issue for them, you know, but then they have their own issues. And so, you know, all schools have, you know, issues, you know, their own issues with classes and with, you know, athlete access, but, but they were really able to figure that out, kind of started out with a light course load, which I, recommend so highly to every single college athlete and even just any college student, just start with an easy course load because it will be harder than you expect and you have a lot of adjustments. So that was really kind of the the biggest piece of advice that I gave them is start out easy, figure it out, figure out what these courses mean, figure out who, who you trust in terms of an advisor, and then get really good advice once you feel like you can ramp it up. Were there any perks that you found for being a a college athlete? I mean, again, you're not in a revenue generating sport. You know, were there any perks that you walked around and said, yeah, this is pretty cool? I mean, there are a lot of them. A lot of them are just kind of little, you know, like I like the, I like the gear we got. I like being able to um, go into interviews and they'd talk to me about, talk to me about stuff and I'd have, or they'd ask me tough questions and I'd have immediate answers about, you know, all these difficult things I had to do, you know, with working on teams and time management and how I could handle anything that they, uh, they threw my way. And I know that in interviews in the working world, they absolutely respect, you know, varsity athletes who can do well in school as well. Um, I think that was a huge perk. And I also just really loved meeting all of the other athletes. It's such a cool community. Um, and I, I just, you know, loved being a part of that. When you graduated, so you just graduated. I did. Did you go through the interview process? Did you feel for a job? Did you feel like being that varsity athlete gave you a, an edge? I do. I went through uh, I went through job recruiting in the fall and was uh, and was lucky lucky to be able to secure a job um, in the fall during the school year and was able to to relax after I got that job. But I think absolutely, I think being an ath- being an athlete is is huge. I know 
that you know they're, they're looking at resumes. I know that they have diff, that um, that companies will view athletes differently. You know, for example, if their cutoff is you know a th- or you know cutoff in quotes is a three seven for for ath- for non athletes, it'll be like a three five for people for athletes or people with really significant time commitments. You know, they understand that you need a bit of a buffer because you just can't do what all the other students do. They get that. Um, but I also felt like it felt like I was you know, much more confident working in teams. And I was, you know, looking at jobs that involved working in teams. And that was something that I think was hugely to my advantage. Okay, Natalie, now it's time for the segment that I call snap judgment. So I get to put you on the spot. What is the one piece of advice you would give to a high school athlete who's considering playing in college? I would have to tell all of those students to really make sure that they love their sport do they really want to play at a high level, at a higher level than they're already playing at for four more years? Are they going to go somewhere that they love, that if, you know, you hope this doesn't happen, but if they have a career-ending injury, they would still be happy? And to constantly make sure that they're happy, to not be afraid to reevaluate their life, whether it's regarding sports, academics, you know, location, if you're, you know, away from your family or just, you know, not happy you know, in the middle of nowhere or something, just really be aware of those. I think that those are very important and can so easily be overlooked, you know, when you're recruited to, you know, a top sport, a top, you know, to a school with a team that's, you know, top in your sport. It's, it's so important to just be aware of those, to be aware of yourself, kind of have those internal gauges. Thanks so much for joining us today, Natalie. No problem. Do you have a youth sports parenting or coaching question for us? Email us at podcast at teamsnap.com and we'll do our best to answer it. If we read your question on the air, we'll also send you a free Nike Team Snap t-shirt. Okay, that's a wrap for this edition of the Team Snap podcast. I'm Emily Cohen, and together we're helping make youth sports safer and more fun one podcast at a time. But before we go, I want to remind you to check out the new CD from the Bay Area Band that plays our awesome intro music. Just go to www.mofone.net. Thanks for joining me today.